Hi, good evening. And welcome to the Minetti Shrem Museum of Art. I'm Priscilla, I'm a second year double major political science and history major. And I am currently serving as a visitor service assistant here at the museum. Before we begin tonight's program, we should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which UC Davis sits. For thousands of years, this land has been a home of the Putwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Putwin tribes, Kachel Dihi, Band of Wintun, Indians of the Kalusa Indian community, Klet Klutzal Dihi, Wintu Nation, and Yocha Dihi, Wintu Nation. The Putwan people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. On behalf of myself and the entire staff of the Minetti Shrem Museum, thank you for joining us. Hi everyone. Um, first, I would like to politely remind you to turn, or to silence your cell phones. Thank you everyone for coming. Warm welcome on behalf of the faculty, students, and staff of the Department of Art and Art History. My name is Sam Rathbun. I am a second year Art Studio graduate student. To begin, I would like to thank Jan Schrem and Maria Minetti Schrem for their generous and visionary support of the arts at UC Davis. Dean Atakwana for her leadership and support the Minetti Shrem Museum for co-sponsoring and hosting our lecture, and the faculty who organize these programs. The California Studio brings a group of internationally renowned artists uh, annually to the Department of Art and Art History at UC Davis. The program builds on the Department of Art and Art History's legacy as home of the to a top-ranked art studio program that since its founding in 1958 has trained individuals that inspire communities and culture. The California Studio expands upon this history by presenting contemporary forms of practice and approaches to studio art education. We are so grateful for the support of Jan Schrem and Maria Minetti Schrem who have made this program possible. I am pleased to introduce the spring quarter California Studio teaching artist in residence, Shimon Addy. Shimon Addy is an internationally renowned visual artist who creates site-specific video, photography, and media art installations. His work prompts viewers to contemplate and reimagine the relationships between place, memory, and identity. Addy often engages with communities who have experienced communal trauma and loss and works with them to create museum, gallery, and public works that consider the potential of regeneration. He has received over 25 commissions to create new works of art in more than 10 countries and his work has been shown in group and solo exhibitions in museums and galleries around the world, including at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Centre Pompidou, Paris, the National Gallery of Art, and um, among many others. Addy is a recipient of numerous fellowships and grants, including from the jo John S. Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Pollock Krasner Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard University, and the Lee Krasner Lifetime Achievement Award. We are honored to have him here with us today. Please join me in welcoming Shimon Addy. If anybody could trip over the cords, it would be me. So I was being extra careful. Can we get those lights, these spotlights turned off somehow? So welcome, thank you so much for coming, uh, uh, spending your afternoon with us today and with me. Um, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I always get a little uncomfortable when I hear the word Lifetime Achievement Award because no one should ever want to be awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very mixed uh, blessing. But anyway, be that as it may, so I've been an artist, I got my MFA in 1991 and I've probably realized about I don't know, I'm maybe like 35 projects, major projects, and I'm only gonna share with you maybe about five. I didn't count. So it's always a, a question of which projects to show and, and how to sort of curate them for you. So I'm just kind of giving you a, 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 bit of, a bit of a mix. So without further ado, um, I will, it's always incumbent upon me to share with you where it all started. And this might be a project that you already are familiar with. The Writing on the Wall, which I realized in one of Berlin's former Jewish quarters right after I got my MFA at San Francisco State. 
<clears throat> in, uh, I think I removed the date, yes, okay, but in, in 1991. And what you're looking at, so I, I come from photography, but when I studied photography, it was very porous. The boundary between lens-based practice, media art, site-specific installation, it was a continuum. There wasn't really, there wasn't clear boundaries between the different media. They were all sort of married together. So with that in mind, what you're looking at is a color photograph that I made of a building in one of Berlin's former Jewish quarters, this is East Berlin, with a slide projection onto the building's facade of what used to be located exactly there in 1930. So it's not Photoshopped, it's not digital montage. If you're walking down the street, you, you look at the building, you see the projection on it. You look at the other side, you see me waving at you, and I have my generator and my four slide projectors, uh, et cetera. And at that time, they really were slide projectors. This was before video projection. These, you know, this was like the old-fashioned Kodak, Kodak carousels. The projections typically lasted for one or two evenings, and then I would go on to another location. I worked on that project for about a year. If you see these color photographs in a gallery or museum, you say, oh, this is photography. If you see the public project on site, you say, oh, this is site-specific installation, or this is a public project. I'm somebody who believes that an idea can exist um, in more than one media, as long as it does so effectively in each. Uh, so this Hebrew bookstore was located right there. Afterwards, we're going to have Q&A. If, um, if some of you might be curious, what were some of the responses of local residents to seeing these projections on their buildings? Ask me, and then I got a couple of good stories about this one. A slide projection of police raid on former Jewish residents. The titles are very clinical and deadpan. They just have the address, like Linienstrasse 7, slide projection of former police raid on, Jew, uh, uh, police raid on former Jewish residents. 19, this, this one's from 1931, former Jewish resident. Also a good, a good story with that one. Uh, slide projection of former uh, Jewish residents. That's Berlin Alexanderplatz. Mm. For those of you who know Berlin, you've probably uh, realized that this is East Berlin. This is the former East Berlin, which looks very different today. This is before it was uh, gentrified. N not that long after the wall came down. This is a projection of a religious book salesman on a pre-war dilapidated building with a, a, a socialist um, housing project on the left side of the screen. Slide projection of a, hat sh a former Jewish-owned hat shop with, with um, resident sitting in front. Former Jewish, former Jewish cafe with patrons. The, uh, the light streak is not from my projector, as that was from a street light. The photographer in me saw that, and I liked it. And so I just let it be, I just sort of let it remain. And I was really putting a lot of energy into the photographs that I was making. Um, because I, I am somebody, you know, there's that, that long, you know, many of us in this room are artists, and there's the whole issue of documentation versus fine art, and I'm somebody who believes that whenever possible, documentation should actually be more than documentation. It should have a, be able to resonate on its own after a temporary work is, is finished. That's not always possible, but when it is possible, I aim for it. Slide projection of former Jewish residents. This is before Photoshop, so even the way the, the slides are masked, uh, like this one, you know, this is like with, I was trying to create this effect of a portal burning through time, the facade of today, the past burning through it. And I, <clears throat> I don't even know if they make these materials anymore, like the Kodak opaque slide paint. Uh, and I, you know, literally I just put the slide, you know, put the slide in the projector, pull it out, paint on it, <clears throat> put it in, nope, don't like it, pull it out. That could go on for two hours, just that process, until I get exactly what I want. Um, or the Kodak um, slide tape to create straight edges. So that, this project was basically, guerrilla, this was guerrilla art. This was like, you know, there was no permission, there was no PR, there was no budget, there was just me, crazy me, a young artist on fire wanting to do this project. My, you know, I, <clears throat> I have 
<clears throat> I have very personal connections to all my projects, even if I don't speak about it. So you don't, like my grandfather was, was from Berlin. But um, in any case, so I mentioned that it was a guerrilla project and very DIY because the next one, of course, was anything but. I started getting these invitations to do large produced projects where there would be budgets and um, you know, the, the, the public would be notified in advance, the press would be notified in advance, I'd have a two year lead time, very produced for better or for worse. So Portraits of Exile was one of my first big produced projects. I was invited by uh, the, the, the city of Copenhagen to create an artwork, whatever I wanted to do, and I, it, it was going to be on the occasion of the 50 year anniversary since the liberation of Denmark, liberation of Copenhagen from the Nazis. So I created an underwater, um, an underwater installation called Portraits of Exile with nine <clears throat> large light boxes. I'm going to just keep talking while this is playing. Nine large light boxes underwater. By large, I mean very large, like, I don't know, eight feet by eight feet by three feet, <clears throat> that were right in front of the Danish parliament building in the canal, uh, the Burzgraven Canal. And on the boxes, so there's this, let me just see if I can. No, 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 no. Oh, this is a funny. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. You get punished for trying. Okay, this one doesn't like to scrub enough. Okay, let me just, let me leave it, let me go back. Sorry. Okay, so now it's doing crazy stuff. Let's just. No. Forgive me, I'm gonna put that over again. Um, <clears throat> So half of the light boxes were portraits of Danish Jews who were rescued to Sweden in 1943 on fishing boats. There was that sort of famous, larger than life, epic rescue of Danish Jews. Uh, they were taken by, uh, it was almost, it was 10,000 people were, were secretly shuttled at nighttime on fishing boats by Danish fishermen to Sweden, which was neutral during the war. Uh, this happened right before they were to have been deported to Nazi death camps. And <clears throat> it's one of those, you know, it's, 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 it's the stuff of legend, right? This kind of mythic, altruistic, larger than life, heroic event. And the other half of the portraits, were, that's a jellyfish, by the way. The other half of the portraits were, were then, pre, when I say then, like mid-90s when I did this project, present-day refugees living in Denmark from Africa, from Asia, from the former Balkans, uh, who were not, had not received such a heroic welcoming hand and were met with a lot of ambivalence. So for me, this, the bridge between these two stories was water. Uh, water is a medium for escape, for rescue, for safe passage, for arrival, for welcoming, into, uh, welcoming someone to a new homeland, and obviously is a medium for memory. So I decided to, to do this underwater light box installation. You know, which today, today may, not, may not sound like a big deal, but no one had ever, ever put light boxes underwater before. So we had to hire marine engineers and have them custom made. And this is before LED technology. This is, by the way, this is a, um, this is a woman from the former Yugoslavia with a, a Danish entry stamp on her passport limiting the amount of time she could stay in Denmark. Um, each of these light boxes weighed about 1,000 pounds. So how do you make a thousand pound light box that doesn't sink, doesn't burn itself up when water touches electricity, um, doesn't float away? So it was complicated in the Q&A, you can ask me about that later. So uh, I'm afraid that this, this scrubbing thing makes me nervous because it's, it's doing its own thing. I just wanna show you the very end. So there, there you see all nine light boxes lined up. It was underwater for about six weeks. And the, the parliament building is right off camera, off frame to the right. 
So you have the artists here sort of spoon feeding the content, but for, for many people on site, um, first and foremost, it's an aesthetic experience. What are these like, what are these enormous illuminated uh, portraits underwater, underwater? It was like sort of a, this kind of a visual astonishment in a sense. So I'm fast forwarding now. Um, I, I did quite a few of those larger projects and I, I wanted to kind of come back to a more simple way of working uh, where, I, where I didn't need to have a huge number of technicians and, and folks like that and wanted to get closer to materials again. And I found that the, working with the moving image was a very, was a way for me to, you know, feel, get my hands dirty again as an artist where I could feel more like an artist rather than a director. Um, this is a little bit of an intense one, but I do find, I do find that in, in university settings, this is, a, this is a good one to show uh, because I, I have many works that are much more exuberant. But um, there was a, any, any British folks in the room? No Brits, okay. If there was a Brit, I wouldn't have to say anything else. They would, they would know what Aberfan was. Uh, Aberfan for a British person is like asking an American, um, uh, do you remember where you were, do you remember the moment that you heard John F. Kennedy was assassinated? Everybody remembers it from their childhood if they were old enough. So Aberfan was this horrific um, coal mining disaster in Wales that buried this village's only elementary school. So the village lost almost all of its children. Um, it was related to coal mining. You can see it there. There's an aerial view of the avalanche from what they call a tip, like a mountainside built of coal, uh, like waste products. And it avalanche down and buried the only school. And I mean, I think 100 and, 125 kids were, were suffocated and 20 teachers and six kids survived because they were lucky, like in air pockets. Um, but then the village became famous as the village that lost its children. It became a site for disaster tourism. This was 1966 when the, the uh, avalanche happened. So for, for the last 40, 50 years, on every major anniversary, the village is kind of harassed by the worldwide news media. People knock on their doors, cameras and mics in hand, what was it like to use your, lose your children? And they feel incredibly, um, well, it's very intrusive, putting it mildly, and that they haven't had the freedom to grieve and to move on because they're also forever associated with a disaster. So, so the, 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 I was invited, um, the, the, the Welsh Arts Council and the BBC thought, well, maybe a contemporary artist could do something different that wouldn't be re-wounding or would show the village in a new way. And so they invited me to come make a project with the village on, on the occasion of the 40, of the, of, at that point it was the 40 year anniversary of the disaster. For two years I declined. I just thought, no, this is, this is, um, no, this is, uh, it, it felt off color and why me, why me? Like why not a Welsh artist? I didn't, I, you know, I didn't understand. I had no connection to, to Wales at that point in my life. I mean, I certainly do now. Um, now, and I, but I do know something about trauma. And so I, that's sort of where I was, um, that's how I connected to it. And I, I created an artwork, uh, a five channel video installation uh, with members of the village. And I, uh, what finally turned me around from a no to yes, I'll do this is, is when I realized that I was free to do whatever I wanted. Because there's been tons of books written about the disaster and tons of documentary films made about it. I wanted to kind of do something different. And I was at a party, a village party once, because they kept inviting me over like the foot in the door technique. <clears throat> and I would go, but I would still say no. But, um, they, they, um, sorry, I, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Oh, so I went to this village party like at a community center <clears throat> and I saw all these characters like out of a Dylan, uh, Dylan Underwood, uh, no, no, sorry, Under Milkwood, Dylan Thomas. <clears throat> All these really, you know, the, there was the fish and chips man and the boxer and the dancer. 
and, and, and the village, the traffic warden. It, it, so everybody looked, seemed very sort of eccentric and really I mean, in a very interesting way. And I thought, well, why can't this village have some of the same Welsh tropes or stereotypes as any other Welsh village, at least in the imaginary? So I filmed the villagers basically performing themselves. There's no digital effects. Um, they're standing on a rotating stage and they're holding static poses. It's going to start with a poem <clears throat> that I co-wrote with the national poet there. Um, hold on. I'm, I, it seems like I'm afraid to even touch the... the, the it seems uncontrollable. The, um, we don't really need to see all this, but if I advance, I'm just, I don't know what's going to happen. So why, oh, that was not good. Yeah, I'm so sorry, I have to come out of this. It's, um, that's very curious that this, this, I can only, That is really curious. It doesn't allow me to fast forward or scrub. If I do anything, it's something, it's like 12 minutes later, um, but that's fine. So you're going to see, <clears throat> you're going to see villagers basically performing themselves, being themselves. And what I mean Life by that- <laughs> stops for a moment and refuses to stay still. I live in a different time from the world. I see them watching me. Here, not here. Now, not now. So it opens with that poem. So you're just looking at one channel out of five, so you can see a way. Oh God, it's so bright. And well, it is red. So in the actual piece, she has projected maybe a little larger than that, maybe about seven feet tall. And this is the dancer of the village. She sees herself as the dancer. The village sees her as their dancer. So she's just holding a static pose. <clears throat> this, is a, this is a standard definition viewing copy, but the real piece is high definition. So you see her, you know, her arms trembling a little bit and blinking and whatnot. <clears throat> village has a disaffected teenager blasting it out of their parents' garage. This is Abermans. Again, we're just on one channel. We're on the center of the center channel of five. So it's a very large, immersive installation. Now you might be saying, well, this is very interesting, Shimon, but why, why this? Why did you use this visual strategy? This is the mayor. He was one of the six kids who survived. Um, the woman, the, um, she, I think she lost her brother. But he, he's, the, he's the mayor, and he, he actually is three of the six people are in the artwork. Three of the six survivors are in the piece. Um, but in any case, the question is, why did I film the individuals in this way? Kind of like rotating statuary. And there's, um, 
there were several reasons I did that. Um, one was um, I wanted a I wanted a, a, a visual language that was basically a moving stillness because that came closest to embodying what I felt about what I feel about trauma that we freeze in response to trauma but it's always incomplete because the forces of life keep moving so it's like a moving stillness or a moving stasis and the other this is the minister she lost two kids in the disaster um, I say the minister it's like a tiny village there's like 30 ministers it's very sectarian um, but in any case um, I lost my thought there oh the second reason sorry for the for the rotating stasis is um, and this is a present day elementary school student um feel themselves to be like floating in as like an aspic like you know that like, like disaster tourism and voyeurism they feel like the world is, has been staring in at them for the last 50 years and so I was trying to sort of reflect that as well which is another reason that I film them in this way so I don't know this is the conductor every Welsh village has a male choir it's very, and boxing. Male choirs and boxing is very big in Wales. And then let me just go on. This is, um, let's see if I can, nope, see, I don't know, it's really, that's really annoying. It is what it is, okay. This is part of the five channel viewing copy, just so you can see how they interact with each other, but they're smaller. The nurse, the policeman, and there is the uh, minister again. A little bit like an August Sander-esque type project. What does it take to make a Welsh village? Well, it takes all of these personages. The music is original. We made that for the piece. I had to live in the village for, I lived in the village like on Main Street for like three months. And then I had to live in Cardiff, the capital city of Wales for another three months for post-production. While I made this piece with the village, the BBC made a documentary about the making of the piece. And that's called, um, they were trying to be a little cutesy, that's called an American in Aberfan. Um, but, and it's, and it's a good film, um, but, but that really shows like my interactions with the villagers, how they felt being in the piece, what they thought when they saw it. Um, you know, there's the fish and chips man. Because we, we, to do a piece like this, especially in such a fraught ter uh, psychological and social uh, setting, uh, requires kind of a, a profound meeting of the minds of all of us. So. It was, a, you know, it was a very challenging project. Um, moving on. No, 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 come on. Maurice getting a little closer. Facts on the ground, um, which I created in Israel, Palestine, where I also have history from my childhood. Um, 2004, 2014, sorry. Um, Site-specific light boxes that I made in order to be photographed. So while there was public interaction and response, um, I primarily was thinking about the resulting photographs. I created about 35 installations across Israel and Palestine. This is called Wild and Urgent. So these are light boxes. There is a generator that's off front camera frame. This is on the edge of an Israeli settlement in the occupied West Bank, what most of the world would call an illegal Israeli settlement, um, with an Israeli flag sort of flying in the distance. And then this is, sort of, this is sort of occupied Palestinian land on the right side of the frame with the phrase wild and urgent. So I was sort of, you know, I was in, in a way I was deliberately overlaying the, sort of the American, like 
manifest destiny kind of uh, impulse uh, in terms of you know colonial expansion, etc. But I was trying to use phrases that were a little difficult to interpret. Was I being congratulatory? Was I being critical? Was I being ironic? Unlike Euphoria, this is part of Tel Aviv. This is exactly where Yitzhak Rabin, the late prime minister of Israel, was assassinated right here in 1995 for trying to make peace with the Palestinians in the form of the Oslo Peace Accords. And unlike Euphoria, it's sort of like, you know, especially content and subject matter that has been so heavily uh, mediated and over-mediated and very political. Um, how does one create work that maybe points to some of that but also gives, leaves interpretive space? It's, not, it's, it's challenging. Uh, landlord, this is on the edge of a Palestinian village that was um, not only occupied but also annexed by Israel in 1967 after the Seven Day War, Six Day War, looking onto what most of the world would call an illegal Israeli settlement, what many Israelis would call a, a new neighborhood of East Jerusalem. And then my, my intervention, landlord. All of one's fears, this is back in Tel Aviv. This is um, on the, that orange structure on the left is a, uh, it's basically an archeology span site. It's the ruins of a former mosque. And it has some potholes in it. You can see one of them or two of them there because it was attacked by rioting Israelis during uh, one of the Palestinian uh, uprisings, the intifadas in the 1990s. And then on the right is a synagogue. That's what the synagogues look like in this neighborhood of Tel Aviv. Uh, it's basically a house, right, with the two stars of David. And then you have my intervention, all of one's fears. So I was kind of trying to express that kind of, um, what's the psychological term? negative projective identification that goes on where I project onto you all of my worst fears of what you're, what you're about. You kind of take that on board and in a way act those out and then you project onto me your worst fears of who I am and then it's off to the races. You know, it's a race to the bottom from there. A problem in logic, that's a separation wall. A particular subject, there's the separation wall again. Also, we sometimes use our own lighting. That's, that's our lighting on the wall, that orange lighting. A particular subject, so I was trying to be deadpan, you know, pointing but not finishing the sentence, so to speak. Finders, keepers, we're looking onto the most contested piece of real estate in the world, the Temple Mount, which even in today's news is a site of much conflict. Finders, keepers, as in finders, keepers, losers, weepers, a very sort of cynical, you know, that kind of, what do they call it in the Middle East? Uh, you know, what they call a real politique. You know, don't give us this soft, mushy stuff. It's just about who, the survival of the strongest. Oh, this, oh, I left this one in here because, of, because we're in Davis. So, you know, I've, I mean, I, I, I lived in Europe for many years. I lived in Israel. I've lived in New York for a long time. But I'm ultimately a product of Northern California. So I went to art school here. I went to UC Berkeley for my undergraduate. I lived in the Bay Area a really long time. And I formed as, I formed as a young artist here. And <clears throat> when I was here, like in San Francisco, at that time, this is like a trip down memory lane for some of you, um, or not, or preceded the twinkle in your parents' eyes. But when I, when I lived in, San, in Northern California, new age culture was really big. So it was all about be here now. Right? I, was that, uh, I don't even remember who made that phrase, if it was like, um, what was the name, the, the S guy? Ron Doss. Was it Ron Doss? Who did oh, 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 then maybe that's where it came from, okay. So, you know, but it was, it was so rampant. And then I, I went to psychology school before I went to art school. So there, I, you know, it, 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 was, it was a whole thing. Anyway, eventually I fled to Berlin, right? But, so, but this, this I, I think about my Northern California days because this, this was sort of my, the liberally overlaying a California-esque trope onto the Middle East, which was like, except slightly modified, no here and now. Meaning in the Middle East, everything is mediated by, uh, inflected by historical grievance. 
and so much so that it's very it's very difficult to, <laughs> to be in the present. I mean, it, it's all about you know centuries of national grievance. Um, so the crossing 2017. Um, this is a project I did in Europe. Again, I'm afraid. Sometimes I have to figure out why it's not letting me control the. It's funny, but it's it's a project I did with seven Syrian refugees. And my father's family comes from Syria. I only mention that because I that was a, a little. It was helpful in the beginning to make an initial connection, and I speak just enough horrible words in Arabic, butchered Arabic that it would bring smiles to people's faces. But uh, I was invited to come to Europe by a European government to do a project of my choice. This was at the height of the refugee crisis. Again, this was in Germany. It was a smaller micro state uh, in Europe. Um, and it happened to have a lot of Syrian refugees there. And I decided this was, I wanted to work with that community. So they had no acting experience, no performance experience in front of the camera. They had all recently crossed the Mediterranean, mostly on rafts, and they were lucky. They survived, and they made it to their destination country, this country, which for the moment shall go unnamed. And, uh, but this country also has a history of the gambling uh, industry, and James Bond films have been shot there, et cetera. So I was kind of thinking about that. You know, I was sort of, that was in my, um, back of my mind. And then I thought to myself, is there anything about the casino game of roulette that might speak to the experience of being a refugee for whom the forces of life and death, number one, are completely outside of one's control or largely outside of one's control, and number two, mean everything. If you're lucky, you live. If you're not, you don't. And so I filmed these seven participants we made this film together um, around a sort of a roulette table. It's a metaphoric game of roulette. It starts with seven participants. It cycles through seven different tableaus, which with it's going to get loud in a second for one, but it's, it's only for a moment. Um, there's just one person left. We don't know if they, if the, if the missing person, if they won, if they lost. Now I'm going to try. She doesn't look very happy. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Okay. This is very strange. Okay.
nutshell, it has to do with preserving their right to interiority, that they have a right to be okay. Um, we think we know what certain types of individuals feel, and we have to ignore you. So I try to diffuse our projections uh, and not give the emotional lift in that way. pieces uh, end with a kind of a dedication for the millions of individuals fleeing the wars in Syria and elsewhere, individuals who have gambled their lives by making the dangerous journey to Europe in hopes of finding new lives. Seven of these individuals appear in this piece. There was also a dedication at the end of the whale, Wales project, but I, 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 I didn't get to that. And sometimes, depending on where I show that piece, it's just shown as a single, uh, single channel film. Other times, I kind of extend it into being an immersive installation. But for that, we have to have space and resources. It requires projectors on the ceiling, where elements of the film are bleeded into the space so that the viewer is, is in the piece. It looks like it's painted on, but that's actually projected from above. Um, so being in the piece rather than looking at the piece. This is a more recent project, which also, which, which also included San Francisco. Some of you might have heard about the San Francisco station because it was not that long ago. It was about 18 months ago, uh, fall of 2021. Um, let me just let this, this is a very good, um, let's just see, is it playing? Yes, okay. It was a floating media installation um, that I initially created for the waterways around New York City. Featuring a 20 foot wide res high resolution LED screen aboard a, aboard a slow moving barge and tugboat, Nightwatch displayed silent close up video portraits of 12 new New Yorkers, individuals whose lives were saved by being around the for asylum. Most of the, you can read it. And we did this during UN General Assembly Week in New York when world leaders would be in town. And so the barge would travel and then it would stop at pre-publicized locations for people who wanted to have like a longer viewing of it. About a nine, a nine minute film is displayed on that LED screen. They're not still images, it's video. Um, you'll see in a moment. I'll show you the And these 12 individuals, you know, they're, they're, they're beautiful. They seem very happy and healthy. And some of them are, but the stories that they have of, of, of fleeing for their lives are almost unimaginable. The same thing with the seven Syrians who ever put in, in the crossing. Horrible stories of losing their parents to the army or being tortured for many days in a row. Of course, the, the photographer in me uh, noticed these juxtapositions like with the Statue of Liberty, and you know, that wasn't lost on me. So they walk it from a distance and slowly approach the camera. And they just look. They, they have kind of restrained expressions again, and they're just, I'm looking at you. You're looking at me. I'm looking at you, you're looking at me, and they maintain the gaze a bit longer than one would expect. So it's, a, it's a, a deliberately a little awkward in that sense. And then the film itself that's on the screen begins with this James Baldwin quote. I'm just showing you like two people from it just so you can get a better sense of the production values. This is, a, this is a, a man from Russia, an artist. God, we're doing well with time. I never go over time. 
You know, some artists do. I don't. I believe in the art of self-editing. Not everything needs to be said. So at least here you can get a better sense. I mean, I'm, my apology is that the room is so light. I would do anything to change it, but it is what it is. So at least hopefully you can get to see a little bit. Um, and he just looks. I told them I, the, the, the cue that I gave them for this piece was, don't think about, I'd like you to not think about anything particularly happy or particularly sad. Just somewhere in the middle. That's what I told them. And now you'll see a group. Uh, many of the people in the piece are from the LGBTQI international refugee community, but not all of them. Some of them were um, unaccompanied minors. So this woman was from Honduras. She was apprehended by ICE at the border uh, without her parents. And then just, you know, just, I couldn't resist it, but San Francisco. Um, so, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Catherine Park Gallery in San Francisco. It's unbelievable. She made my watch happen in all by, basically all by herself. I don't know how she did it. I've never seen anything like it. She raised all the money, she did the whole, everything, which normally would take like a, a, a mid-sized mid arts organization to pull off. The, this is from Fort Mason. Um, again, being the photographer that I am, I do try, whenever possible, to make images that hopefully have some kind of resonance even after the piece is finished. But again, certain situations lend themselves more to that than others, so there, there are limitations. This is, that's the Brooklyn Bridge. No, that's the Manhattan Bridge, I think. No, it's, oh, whatever. And we go from there to there. The Golden Gate Bridge, the Bay Bridge, Alcatraz, Bay Bridge. She's from Venezuela, this woman, a political dissident. And last but not least, my most recently completed project, Starstruck, an American Tale, 2022. Yeah, it's like six months ago it, the exhibition happened. Um, and it's, it's coming out shortly as a monograph also. So I don't know if, how much any of you know about Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Are there anyone here, is anyone here who feels like they know quite a bit? Are you from there? You've been there? I see. So the the um, the four sentence the four or the the four sentence idiot's guide to Bethlehem's history. So I like with Wales, I knew nothing about Bethlehem when I was invited to come, um, and I when I, I, I once I dug my teeth into it, this place is like incredibly interesting. Oh my God! So it was founded by this utopian fundamentalist Christian sect in 1741 called the Moravians. They wanted to make the new Beth the Bethlehem of North America. So you might think, oh, well, what's the big deal? Actually, they were really unusual. They were, it was one of these sort of failed utopian community stories. They were socialist. They were uh, very egalitarian. They had a kind of a wild theology. Some people have written about them and said it was the first example of queer theology. They felt that everyone's soul was feminine, whether you're a man or a woman, and that was so you could be the bride of Jesus. So eventually they, they were, the European headquarters in Germany brought them 
um, you know, made them more mainstream. Um, okay, that's that. 100 years later, Bethlehem Steel. Okay, in like 1880s or so, Bethlehem or 1860s, Bethlehem Steel starts up. It becomes the steel capital of America for 100 years. And then around 1990s, like, the, like most of the steel industry all over the world, it collapsed, except for in China. But everywhere else, it collapsed. Um, okay, so what's the big deal, Shimon? Well, listen to this. After the steel industry collapsed, the late Sheldon Adelson, whose name some of you may or may not know, who was a, a Las Vegas casino magnate, billionaire, largest don't, uh, contributor to the Republican Party, just as an aside. But he came in with his Sands Casino and bought up part of Bethlehem Steel and turned it into a gambling casino. So I was just like flabbergasted by just these uh, really strange, uh, curious juxtapositions. So now to my piece. So on the hill in Bethlehem, on the mountainside, is a, is a 90 foot tall Moravian Christian star. It's, view, it's viewable for 60 miles in every direction. It's huge. So I was like, okay, and this is what it looks like in the daytime. It's 90 feet tall. And I thought, huh. Now, I'm, I'm kind of doing a short version of, you know, the way, art, the way artists conceive of ideas is, it does not work so, like, in this, in this kind of way. But basically, I, w I wanted to create a, a mixed media installation. This is for the, the museum at Lehigh University where I was artist in residence. So I worked with the architecture and design students. We, they went up to the hill, to the top. They made an exact CAD drawing down to every single detail of the star. So we had an exact clone of the star built. This is it's still in the process of being built here. Um, at the university, except two, two changes from the one on the hill. Instead of 90 feet tall, it was 11 feet tall because the museum ceilings were 12 feet. But instead of just being a white, uh, like, a, like a sacred white color, the, the lighting array was jerry-rigged so that sometimes it would be white and then other times it would be like a, a casino wheel of fortune. And it would alternate back and forth. So that was the sculpture, sculptural component of the installation. And then what I did is I filmed um, six people who I, from the Bethlehem community who I felt were, I don't want to say uh, em emblematic or iconic, but let's just say they, they, they embodied a, a specific community in Bethlehem or a specific history. This is a young African-American woman. I filmed them at, all of, at some of these key sites in Bethlehem. Here I filmed, this is, the, this is up at the Bethlehem Star. Now, this is a former steel worker, right? Also filmed at the Bethlehem Star. Why would he be there? Why would I, why? So some, some of the, some of the juxtapos, juxtapositions were, are expected and some of them are not. That was intentional. Here we expect him to be. He's at the ruins of the steel plant. So um, it's, it, the, the installation is actually 18 minutes. I'm just playing you a little excerpt. It alternates between video and, um, uh, video and, and the star sculpture. They're, they're, they're typically not on at the same time. Um, hold on a second. Here we go. Now again, I, I, would, I would actually um, scrub through that, but this excerpt is about three or four minutes. We'll see how far we get. You don't have to read that. It's just, it, it's just explaining the specifics of the installation. A two-channel video with a star sculpture in the middle. So, so the star, okay, so this is just sort of the last chapter of the piece. The star is turned off, so you don't see it. And now we're just kind of coming into the video. He's the lily of the valley. Jesus. 
Jesus on his chariot ride. Oh, so a Moravian woman in period clothing, a gospel singer, white a nurse who worked as the emergency room, and made the piece during the time of COVID. Um, the African American woman, the young woman, a blackjack dealer from the casino. These are some of the personages that are that are in the piece. The former steel worker. So the woman on the left is now in inside the Moravian church. Blackjack dealer and this is sort of towards the end. see a couple of still you can just sort of see the and this we don't I was just showing you some of the play color the book is coming out in a like soon from Black Dog Press in London and that does it thank you very much Thank you much, so much, Simone. Um, we can now open the floor to questions. Thank you so much. Um, as someone uh, planted this question with me, I won't tell you who, but uh, it, what were some of the reactions that you got uh, on the uh, site, <laughs> on the writing on the wall exhibit when you showed it in Berlin? And I also wondered if you could say where you found the images that you photographed and then, and then um, uh, projected. Sure. Um, the, uh, and now I realize I shouldn't have just slammed my computer closed because it'd be good to have an image up while I'm talking to you. Um, the, um, <clears throat> it took about three months of archival research before I did the first projection. So I, I went to at least 10 different archives. So they were either like, st uh, like city of Berlin archives, federal archives, archives of the Jewish community, press archives, some like the big press houses. And even I went to one or two Jewish families where it was known that there had been a photographer in the family and they would loan me some of their photographs too. But it was three months of, of um, just doing research. Now I just wanna pull up an image because it's much funner what, if I answer, when I answer your question if you can just see the image. I know, I know you're barely going to be able to make it up as we turn the lights on, but this one, the Hebrew bookstore, it's a great example. So 
I did that for uh, two consecutive nights. Okay. So let me get this right. Okay, the first night. Um, just by chance, I was there with a, a, a film crew from the Nightly News. I mentioned that for a reason, partly because this is broadcast all over Germany, what happened. So, how did this go? I was across the street from the building with the projection on. Somebody comes out, turns around, looks at the projection, and just like, looks like they're becoming enraged. And they walk across the street like this, and the TV <coughs> put Mike in his, he didn't even care, he just kept going. And he says, um, it was in German, of course, he said, my father bought this house fair and square from Mr. Jacob in 1938. And I didn't, I didn't even know what he was on about. And then he repeated it. And then I pulled myself together and said, um, do you know what happened to this Mr. Jacob after 1938? Now, I'm just reporting. I'm just telling you what he said. Okay? I, I'm not interpreting it right now. But he said, Abba Naturi, why, of course, he was a multimillionaire and moved to New York. Is that that's what's the fate of, of Berlin's Jews? And, and I wanted to mention these were not. This was not a wealthy German Jewish neighborhood before the war. This was Polish and Russian Jewish. And they were poor. They ate pigeons for, for food. It was very very poor. So that was kind of a very curious. So here I am as an artist. You know, we artists, you know, we're working in like the poetic imaginary, right? Symbolic. He thought I was literally trying to reclaim his house. <laughs> and so he was putting up a defense before, you know, well, my, my father bought this house fair and square. So get out of here, you know, get away, like, don't you dare, you know. And I was not at all looking at that concrete uh, world. This was somewhere else that I, that I was sort of uh, living in. Um, Next night, now you can't make this stuff up, that's why I'm telling you the story. You literally can't make it up. Next night, in the same projection, you know, sometimes I would do it more than one night if I, if I felt that I didn't get the kind of photography that I wanted to get and I had to go back, or for whatever reason. Um, one of those windows, I don't remember if it was the center one or the one on the edge on the right, opens up a very elderly woman reaches her head out, looks down, sees the projection, looks at me across the street. The street's very narrow. It's, it's about, I don't know, half, at the most, it's half the side, half the width of this building, of this room. And she says, and not aggressively, she just says, no, no, no. And I looked up, and I was like, what does this woman want from me? I, and like most artists, you know, we're stubborn about our work, so I went, he just ignored her, I just kept working. And then she repeats herself, she says, no, no, no. And again, she wasn't aggressive, but I was, I was mystified. I, I said, okay, so what do you mean no, no, no? And she said, it was one meter to the right, I remember. <laughs> that actually happened. So, I mean, I've told that story a million times, but for good reason. I mean, it's just, so the weird collisions in terms of the past and the present, you know, all of that, it's kind of amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for your lecture, Shimon. Sure. Um, you said something that was really interesting to me, very quickly and quietly, um, that there, there are personal personal connections to all your mm -hmm, projects, mm -hmm. but you don't mention them. No. Yeah. So, and I'm not saying I'm no, asking no. you to, but I it raised questions for me. I um, I'm very curious about that comment. Yes. I wonder if you could elaborate. I, yes. um, one question is: Are you leaving room for the viewer's own experience, or what what is the rationale behind leaving well, out it's, that? It's a very good question. You know, it, it is. It's interesting that you picked up on that. Um, I, I I'm not shy of. Uh, um, revealing a personal connection to a given project if I'm, if I'm asked. But I don't lead with that. And I, e even when I mention, even when I mention the thing about the Syrian project, when I say that my father's family is from Syria, even my saying that makes me feel uncomfortable. A, a little bit. 
but that's partly to inoculate against the, you know, the whole thing about appropriation and you know, who can speak for whom and blah, 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 you know. But that's not really answering your question. It's this, it's this complicated thing about the role of an artist's biography in the, perception, in the reception of their work. And what role, you know, what role that, that plays, could play, should play, should not play. So I, I kind of feel like, um, you know, I'm not that interesting. Let's just get me out of the way. And hopefully the art will speak for itself. But it's not, it's not just that. But it's also about this thing of, it's so interesting how this works. It's so complicated. The kind of binary that we create between is this a personal project or is this a personal or is this a political social project? Like we create this binary which isn't the case. So I don't know that I make a separation. Uh, so that that's even the reason why I say I have personal connections to all of my projects. So it's not like it's not like they're they're not devoid of my own autobiography, even if it's not displayed front and center. But it is something I think a lot about, and it's complicated because precisely because we all know really good work that's deeply personal, and that and where the personal specifics are front and center. So there are there are no absolutes about this, you know. It's, yeah, but it's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Oh, hi. That was beautiful. Oh, Thank great. You. Thank you. I have maybe a silly comment or question. I. I don't know if it's meaningful or not. My head is really thick, but when you were talking about the Aberfan mm -hmm. and the idea of photographing these people floating mm -hmm. as a metaphor of time, mm -hmm. for me, I've always thought of floating as a metaphor for love and also, in turn, for death. So I saw kind of a very uh, multi-layered mm -hmm. and complicated narrative that was in some play, some ways devastating and in some ways very tender-hearted mm -hmm. and sweet. And so, I don't know, I just thought I'd, it's not really a question, but mm -hmm. maybe if you were thinking something like that also, I don't know. Well, it's always this thing of, um you know, that's a big topic, and it makes me feel like I should share with you, send you a link to the BBC documentary, mm. because that really captures how I sort of worked with individuals in the community, and kind of the, you know, the intention that I had, like, I would say things like, um, they would take a pose, kind of like, I'd say to like the fish and chips man, Sh show me the kind of, what you do each day when you're at work. And then I would say, oh, freeze, freeze, freeze right there. That's good. And then I'd walk up with a, walk up with a, um, a book of sculpture, classical sculpture photographs. And I, I'd look at it with him and I'd say, you know what? If you turn the basket this way, it becomes more timeless and a little bit more um, iconic. Like you're, you're every Welsh fish and chips man. You're not just Aberfan. And I, I'm not responding to the specifics of what you're saying, except to say that yes, and yes. yeah, all you know, no, nothing was you know this this thing of moving stillness, right? Is that's where I was coming from, and I, I was thinking about trauma, um, but of course it's it's kind of multivalent how that can what that can speak to. Thank you so much. And I was kind of wondering, so a lot of these you very selectively choose, especially the ones involving particular people for mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a process to select when you're selecting, you know, only six or nine people from mm -hmm. a rather large area? Do you have a process to that or an idea behind how you do that? I do, and it, it usually takes a few months. And it's very uh, challenging and complicated. Um, because the first thing is to get people on board. So if you imagine these Syrian, the, the, like the seven Syrians in the crossing, literally some of them had been, some of them had been on rafts crossing the Mediterranean within uh, two months before the film was started. So like very recent, and some of them I found in Red Cross uh, centers, and and also refugee self-help 
uh, what do you call it, grassroots, grassroots organizations. And so the first thing is to kind of, for me to sort of gain their trust, regardless of what my selection process was. So my selection process kicks in after there's sufficient escape velocity where, you know, where people, where I, I can see there's a community of people who would be interested. So the first thing is the game of trust. So that's very difficult. Here I am as an artist from New York. You want to do what? You know, like a roulette table. They, they, their parents were more like that. They, they were cool with it. I said to them, you know, I, I told them my idea. And I, you know, and, and I said, that, does this thing of roulette, does it speak to your life experience or doesn't it? And if it doesn't, we're not doing it. And they said, Shimon, this is exactly our life experience. Let's do it. So we did it. Anyway, it proceeds over a series of meetings. So maybe I meet with one person, then I meet with three people, then I meet with five, then I, and so, and then yes, while that's going on, while they're sizing me up, yes, I'm sizing them up. Would they be good in front of a camera? Do they, do they have a, something that's unique about them that would be different than any other person in the piece? A different demographic, a different type of faith, Face, a different, uh, you know, just a different vibe. Um, because what we don't want is redundancy. So, so you know, it's 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 a it's a process. It's a long it's a long process. Uh, and but I think I do think I I think I have a pretty good talent for kind of um, you know sorting who might be good as a as a participant in front of the camera. Thank you. Yes, sure. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Okay, so this question's a little long, so I was thinking of how to word it. But um, earlier you said that you know people often create this binary of a project that's personal versus political, social, but that boundary doesn't really exist. And also um, in Crossing, you talked a little bit about by keeping people's right to opacity and transparency, well, so right to opacity and interiority. Um, and then that was in Crossing and Nightwatch, you had the quote on James Baldwin and the other. So to me, it's sort of all connecting on this idea of like theory of identity and self. And I was wondering in how you're in your works when you're focusing on subjects that are so often othered or based on their identity, how do you cross the boundaries between them and the viewer without, you know, erasing their right to their own opacity, like without creating this complete right. transparency? Right, right. No, it's, it's one of the most challenging things that I, in, in, my, in my work, I um, and in this and in this BBC film that I mentioned, that's also a topic that comes up. And I, uh, the way I describe it, because I don't, I haven't figured out a better way of describing it. There might be one, but the best way I have found to describe it is that I grow really big ears. This is not about me. I'm like I mean really. Be centered from the whole thing, and they are—they are the—they're they, centered in the stories, and so um, you know there is that kind of even thing about trust. Like I—I I would show them my past work, and then I would explain my idea for a new project and what I wanted it to achieve, what I wanted, or was hoping it would might achieve, and they—if I most of the time they would come to trust me and get excited because also it was something new for them that they hadn't quite done before. Everyone's used to journal on something big interview, but this was something kind of different. Um, so very tender love, very, a very light footprint as much as possible. Even if, even if what we did, the resulting pieces look very dramatic and anything but light, but the process is quite, is quite light. Um, so there was only one person in, in our band who we wanted to be in it, and in the piece, and we, we, we couldn't bring her along. I, I tried my best, but she was too traumatized by the decades of the news media, and she, she, you know, she, she didn't do it. And with the Syrian project, there was a point where I, I wanted to have more of an age range, because those people were all young and beautiful, and you know, and. There were a couple of people who were like in their 50s who were going to do it, and they, they changed their mind. It was just a little, they just, it was just one bridge too far for them. Um, 
So, so I'm not saying it all comes up roses. I mean, sometimes it doesn't work out, but enough of the time, thankfully, thankfully it has. I hope that kind of answered your question. Okay, thanks. Yes? Gina. Yes. And just to, just to um, say that I, I've done several projects with language, even though that is correct, I only showed one. But I, in, the, in the curating for the presentation, I, that's how the cookie crumbled. Um, I, I, but to answer your question, though, I, um, I think I did it because of the, le the nature of political discourse, right? Ideology is very textual, right? It's, like very, it's very textual, like ideology. Declarations of Independence, UN Charters, the, 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 the UN Charters 242, 244. I mean, it's very, very text-based. And I wanted to use, also, you didn't ask me this, but it's in English on purpose, because it could have been in Hebrew or Arabic. But I wanted to use a language that was kind of removed, and so trying, that would triangulate the other two, that neither the Palestinians or Israelis could claim ownership over the language English. So the reception was a mix. It was it was it was it was a mixture. It was a mixture. I did a few um, installations in the Palestinian Authority-controlled areas of the West Bank, and you know there was a lot going on there, independent <laughs> of my project. So you know, some other time I can tell you some sort of harrowing stories of things that happened, but it wasn't really related to what I was doing. I just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, but in the Palestinian-controlled areas, there was kind of like, um, people kind of, they, they were supportive, you know, they could see that I was maybe, they, and, I mean, I'm working as an artist, but they would, ins they would say, oh, he's, this is probably critic for critiquing the occupation or critiquing the separation wall. Um, they didn't say it like that, but that's what I deduced from the responses. The Israelis, it's a complicated thing, you know, Israel, you can't just, as some of you have been there, uh, wouldn't know, you know, you can't just pull up in a car and pull a generator out of it and these light boxes and think you're going to be left alone for more than 10 seconds, right? So it just doesn't work like that in a military situation like that. So I had to hire, I hired a producer about six months before I arrived because I was only going to have a short time. This is one project where I knew what I wanted to do by the time I got there. That doesn't always happen. This, because I have a long history, and this is a topic I've thought about my whole life. So, and so I, had, I got permits for every single installation, permits, the official pieces of paper, but um, uh, unlike in Germany, sorry, Manfred, but you know, in, 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 in Germany, the papers mean something, right? The allowedness, or, you know, you, it actually means something. In Israel, it's, like, it's almost like the same in Rome, when I lived in Rome. You just take it and you tear it, just tear it up. No one cares about the, permit, the official permits. No, it's all about, I, I know I'm, I'm, I am, yes, I'm going into a tangent. I am riffing off of your question, just going elsewhere for a moment, only because it's kind of, I thought it was kind of fun. So, so here I am, I have permits, I have the permissions. So sometimes I would work in these West Bank settlements with these fanatical settlers, right? And yes, I did, I did reveal my political inclinations on that topic, God forbid, but so I would be doing these, I had, we had the permission from like their, their administrative offices, and they'd come out of their trailers, and they, you know, I remember, and they'd be like, what are you doing? And so I would uh, say, well, I, I do have permission, and then, you know, I had somebody, an assistant with me, and they'd pull out the, he said, no, 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 what, what are you doing? So I would say, I would say, um, I don't remember if I was speaking in English or Hebrew. I, I would say, uh, probably you. I said, I'm American. I'm an artist. I was invited by, the, this is Israeli Art Foundation, the Art Port Tel Aviv. I was invited by this thing to come to Israel and do a project. And this is what I'm doing. So they would smile, a big, big smile, and then they'd say, oh, New York. 
my mother came from Brooklyn. You know, I was like Brooklyn, like something. So my and then, and then it was like I was part of the family. And it, what? So it just showed me. It reminded me in Israel: if you're white, if you're male, if you if you're Jewish, if you speak some Hebrew, you are cut so much slack and have an enormous amount of privilege. So I was just really reminded of that. There was one time where it did not go well, okay? And it, there, was, there was one time where, where somebody was really determined to, to stop what we were doing. And it did get resolved, but I, I, <laughs> I'm not gonna say that in this context. Let's just say certain things always grease the wheels. So it came down to that. Okay, yes, did you have a question? Oh, okay. We have time for about one more question. Okay, one more, yes. Hi. Uh, now, you mentioned earlier that sometimes some of your art processes uh, take about two or so years to like plan or execute upon. The big ones, yeah. What is your favorite part about doing those? When you are given like the time to really like think, digest, and mm -hmm. execute upon a project. No, no, I can tell you, and there may not be uh, only one favorite time, but I can tell you my two favorite times. So. Uh, one is that the first few months that I can just do research. I just get to have fun. It's all just about ideas. And nothing has to be, nothing has to cohere. I, so like Bethlehem, I, sorry, I began by reading maybe like five books about Bethlehem. And it was just, so, it was really interesting, really fun, and, you know, playful, and whatnot. And you get to this kind of, um, you know, you're probably an artist, right? You're an artist. So you get into this thing of, um, you know, experimentation. But this was like sort of like more like cognitive experiments. But what if I did this? And what if I did that? What if I did this? What if I did that? It's very fun. The other thing that's really fun, because I do work a lot with the moving image, and it is very high pressure when you work with communities because they're giving you like a day of their life or a half a day of their life or whatever with your days of their life, and you have to be like totally on and not waste anybody's time. So I'm always, I always become very relieved and happy when the production is over. And I can just go into post-production and editing because the public's not right there and take time. It's less pressure, it's less pressurized and more fun. So that's the answer. Thank so, you thank so you. much. Shimon.